guys, uh, great to be here. You know, it's a little bit strange. I feel like I'm looking out at a, bu a bunch of bank robbers and stuff with all your masks on, you know. Uh, in sharing with you this morning, uh, I was trying to think about how long ago it's been, maybe four years, uh, possibly a little bit longer than that since we've been here. And folks, of course, every time we come, there's a new people, so we have to give a little bit of an understanding so you'll know what we're talking about and put it in the proper context here. You know, uh, for me and Vicki, it's always a great pleasure to come here. I wish she could be here today, but we're actually uh, heading back to Africa uh, a week from Monday, and she doesn't travel well. She has uh, some very severe, uh, serious health issues, and so travel is extremely hard on her and she has to be limited to it when this time comes. But she did send, especially to Elizabeth, her love, and wanted to uh, let you know that she's praying for you and cares for you. Uh, and sharing with you this morning will be in Acts chapter 9, and the title of the message is called The Road to Damascus. And guys, one of the things that I want to share with you uh, so that you'll have a little bit of an understanding is that we have been involved in the longest-running civil war in Africa, the war in southern Sudan. In the last 64 to 65 years of the nation, we've had over 40 years of declared war but there's really been no time in the last 64 to 65 years that we have not been fighting somewhere in the Sudan. We used to be just fighting the radical Islamic army of the north. Uh, now we're, according to one of the generals who spoke with me, he said we are fighting uh, five different armies and there's 148 different rebel groups operating in the southern Sudan. Last summer it was updated to the third most dangerous nation in the world to live in. Uh, the first was Syria, the second was Iraq, and the third was the southern Sudan. And about 21 years ago, we became the official training arm for the South Sudan Army of training all pastors and chaplains for their military. And they're not like we think of chaplains in America, guys. Our whole purpose is ministry, but all of my men are combat chaplains. All of them are armed. All of us go into battle. And I know that seems a little bit strange right now, but as we get in the message, I think you'll have a little bit of a better understanding. Uh, we have a very intense Bible school. We get the guys up at five o'clock in the morning. We run them nine miles. We take them four and a half miles up a mountain, then four and a half miles down. And then we have eight hours of class time a day and two and a half hours of study time in the evening. And we only feed them two meals a day. And the reason we do that isn't because we can't afford to feed them better, but if we don't train them hard, they will not survive. We're gonna start by showing you guys a couple of photos if we can bring those up to give you a little bit of an understanding here. Let's see, this comes up here. All right, there we go. That's uh, the front uh, gate of our base in the South Sudan. Uh, and as you can see, uh, guys, it's a fortress. Uh, these walls are actually designed to stop 50 caliber machine gun bullets. And if you're not familiar with how powerful that is, one bullet can just about cut a man in half. Uh, this is a small portion of the compound. Over 700 people can live on this one. Let's go to the next one. Uh, just to kind of another view of the wall there, uh, we made it to look like what I would call a Jerusalem or a Crusader's castle. And the reason we've done that is there's literally no jobs in the southern Sudan. Outside of the military, I would suspect that the employment of what we would call real jobs is probably maybe 3% for the entire nation. And one of the reasons we're having so many rebel groups is because nobody can make a living there and they see war is the only way to get things. We're actually going to build 10 castle towers across the city. Each of them will have a biblical mosaic on it. We have the Nile River there, we have a national park that's not being used, and we're hoping to create thousands of jobs over the years to begin turning the course of the nation. Next one. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and go to the next photo. There we go. This is our church, uh, Calvary Chapel Cush in Nimali, South Sudan. Uh, we have three services. The first is in English, the second is in Arabic, and the third is in Mahdi, which is a local dialect. These are just the adults with the children's choir in front. Next one. Uh, this is our Sunday school. On a sunny day, we get about 1,800 children. On a rainy day, we get about 1,200 because everybody walks to church. Next one. These are the chaplains in both field dress and, uh, and uh, operational uniform, so you see both of them. Next one. This is a completely different facility in northern Uganda. It's a school that we opened up in February this year. Unfortunately, we had to shut it down because of the virus. Uh, it is designed to hold 700 children. Again, the high walls are to uh, protect against Islamic terrorism. Uh, we put armed guards on the walls. We're putting up long-range uh, thermal imaging cameras so that if they come for the children, we can intercept them five miles out and destroy them before they get to the kids. Next one. This is the inside of the school. Now, guys, you're seeing a small portion of this compound. We just cannot get it all in a photo. But uh, to the left is, uh, is the dorms. To the right is classrooms. Next one. As you can see, our guys are pretty big boys. We train them pretty hard. Next one. 
In the center in the uniform is the President of Southern Sudan. The man in the light blue jacket to his left is the Commanding General of the South Sudanese Army. I led him to Christ 21 years ago. And guys, you can pray for him. There is great likely that he will be the future President of the Sudan. He's an extremely godly man. He loves the Lord. Uh, I was actually the best man in his wedding. My wife Wiki was the maid of honor. I hear from him almost on a weekly basis <clears throat> here in America. And <clears throat> if he does become the President, he will most likely declare the Southern Sudan a Christian nation. Now there is no nation in the earth that declares that, actually means it. If he does it, he will mean it. He is a great leader, a great warrior, and a great man of God, so please pray for him. I'm sharing with you this morning, uh, I think as believers that, uh, I think there's some great misunderstandings in the body of Christ, guys. Being in Calvary Chapel, you guys are extremely fortunate. Going verse by verse through the Bible, we hear and learn the Bible in the context of which we were meant to learn it. And so because of that, we have a great understanding of the Word of God. But I do believe there are some things that are universally misunderstood in the body of Christ. For example, most of us understand that salvation is a free gift of God. We get that. But what a lot of believers do not understand is that the rewards of heaven are earned. And if we never do anything for Christ in this life, why do we expect great treasure on the other side of eternity? The Bible says in my father's house there were many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But guys, it doesn't say they're all mansions. It says there's many mansions. I've often wondered how many one-bedroom flats or two-bedroom condos there are up there. And I think it's really strange to think that if we never serve Christ, we expect these great treasures on the other side of eternity. I believe that there was a road that God intended for the church to travel that many of us will never travel folks. While many of us begin to travel the narrow road, I believe that the road that God wanted the church to travel was what I would call the road to Damascus. When Saul was on the road to Damascus, he's a Pharisee. He's a part of the very high religious order of the day in Israel. He believes that the church is a cult. He is persecuting the church. He wants to destroy the church. He's giving approval when Christians are being killed. And he's on his way to imprison Christians in Damascus. But see, he has an encounter with Jesus Christ on the way, and God reveals himself to Paul. And that's where he will become, go from Saul to becoming Paul the Apostle. Once Paul has that encounter, his life is forever changed. He is literally never, ever the same man again. And see, this is one of the things that I think is supposed to happen to us. When we become born again, we are supposed to be transformed by the gospel. Our lives are not to belong to us anymore. We do not do the things that we think that we have the right to do. But we are supposed to be a people that is truly lost in Christ. And this is the way it's supposed to be. And you have to realize a lot about Paul the Apostle, folks. He was a brilliant man. He had a teacher by the name of Gamaliel, and Gamaliel talked about him when he was Saul. And he said the hardest thing that he found for Saul was finding enough books for him to read. I believe that he was tested today. He would test at a genius level. He's authored many of the books of the New Testament, and I think God used him because his intellect was so great that he was able to rightly divide and hear the Lord clearly and put down on paper what God intended for the church to hear. And I want to start by reading you a portion of this because, folks, once Paul does this, whatever his ambition were the day before, and I think he had planned to climb as high as he could in the religious order. But whatever those ambitions were, once he met Christ, it was forever gone. It was just completely finished. And many of us, we've not come to that place. We've become saved, but our lives still belong to us. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Let me start by reading in Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked her for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand of Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my 
name before the Gentiles, the kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house. He entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, folks, many people believe this is where Paul the Apostle started his ministry, but that's not what happened at all. For the next 13 to 14 years, Paul the Apostle disappears. We really do not know much about his life during this time. The scripture is strangely silent. We know for a time that he was in Arabia, but beyond that, we know almost nothing about his life. But what was ever happening in his life, God was putting tremendously deep roots into his life. When Paul starts his public ministry, he will only have 22 years of ministry before he'll be killed for his faith. 11 years in, he writes the second book of Corinthians, and he talks about the suffering that he went through in the first 11 years. And he says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from Gentiles, in danger from Jews, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger from sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides all these other things, I face daily my pressure, my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn. Paul tells us that in the first 11 years of his ministry that he has been beaten nine times severely for the gospel. The reason the Jews would give you 40 lashes minus one, meaning 39 lashes, is they used a whip called the cat nine tails. It had a long rod with nine to 12 pieces of leather that hung down from it. Within the leather was pieces of metal, pieces of bone, and pieces of shell. And when you would hit someone on the back, it would literally grab the flesh and pull it right out of your body. The reason they gave 39 lashes is most men died at the 40th lash. Now, not everybody made it to the 39th, folks, but as a general rule at 39, you would survive and at 40 you would die. They literally learned to beat a person within an inch of their life. And early historians talk about that. They said that when men were beaten like this, they said even if they survived, often they went mad. They were never the same person again. It actually drove them insane. And yet Paul says of his life, I count my life worth nothing if only I might finish the race which God has set before me. See guys, his life did not belong to him. He did not have the ambitions of his own life, the soul things that he wanted. He was not on the journey of what I would call the American dream, but he was on a journey. He was sojourning towards heaven, serving Christ. He was there as God's representative in a world today. And folks, I think about my own road to Damascus experience. It did not come when I first became born again. You know, I had actually lied about my age when I was in the 10th grade and joined the United States Marine Corps. I volunteered for combat duty in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, I was actually a pretty highly trained soldier, guys. Uh, I was deployed to an amphibious raider battalion. I, tamed, I trained at the Navy, uh, Navy SEAL base, the Army Ranger base. We had our own specialized training. And I was a competitive shooter in the Marines. I used to travel around and shoot competition, battalion and division matches. I was what was called a, a PMI, a primary marksmanship instructor. And my coach actually said to me, he goes, Wes, you are so good with weapons, I think that you could shoot the Olympics. Well, I never wanted to shoot the Olympics. I just wanted to shoot other people. So I had no interest in going down that road there. But I remember that when the war in Vietnam got over, because I joined and we were getting ready to mount up and go back into Vietnam because it was falling. And then President Ford called it off and we all had to come back home. Well, when I realized that I'd missed the war in Vietnam, I decided to get out of the Marine Corps and go to Rhodesia and become a soldier of fortune. Fortunately, Christ would get a hold of my life, folks, and it would change everything about me. And I remember that many years later, my brother Rick talked to my mother about this. And uh, he said, you know, Mom, he goes, when Wes left to join the Marine Corps, he goes, I did not want him to ever come back again. He goes, he was the meanest man I have ever met in my life. He goes, when he would fight people, he wouldn't just fight them. He would purposely injure them. He was extremely cruel with his words, and he was a mean individual. He said, but when he became a believer, he said, he changed so much, I did not want him to ever leave again. Two of my brothers, including this one, have also followed me, and they're both on the mission field today. And folks, one of the things that happened is when I became a believer, it changed my life. I actually had my mother, my stepfather, my three brothers, and my sister, and my real father all to Christ. Everyone in my family has now uh, become born again, at least as far as I can tell. And one of the things that I need, wanted to, you to understand is that, you know, when I was in the military, uh, 
before I went into the military, I, I don't know that I was such this evil person that my brother described me as, but like many of you have experienced, if you've ever grown up in schools where they're violent and you're fighting gangs and it's not one against one, but it's 10 against one, well, that's what I went through. And so I came to the point that I said, I'm done with this. If I have to kill someone, I'm gonna kill them, but I'm not going through this anymore. And I got myself a gun. I had a switchblade that was about that big. I loved it because when I would push the button, it would clack, it looked like a machete, it was so big, and it would scare people to death, and they would leave me alone. But really what I was just trying to say to people was, leave me alone. I did not want to be bothered. But see, Christ changed everything about that. Now, my own road to Damascus experience did not come when I first got saved. It would come a number of years later. When I got saved, I began to read the Bible, sometimes as much as nine hours a day. As a general rule, somewhere probably between about three and five, but upwards sometimes of nine hours a day. The first book that I read after the Bible was called a book called Tortured for Christ, written by Richard Wombrandt. Richard Wombrandt was a Romanian pastor that spent 14 years in prison for his faith, and he was tortured extensively. Now folks, the Romanian communist government could have easily killed him, but because he was a leader in the church, they were trying to break him. Uh, most of the people that came against the communist government, they just executed him. And I remember that when I got out of the Marine Corps, I heard that he was speaking at a large church in Southern California. It was not a Calvary Chapel, but the pastor of that church is considered one of the greatest theologians of our generation today. And I remember that when Reverend Wombrandt walked into the church, he walked in wearing his socks. And the reason he did that was when he was in prison, they would often try to get him to deny his faith. Well, he would refuse to do it, so they would take him, lay him across a table, they would take his shoes and socks off, and they would break all the bones in his feet. And they did this on multiple occasions with him. His feet were so damaged, it was very difficult for him to walk in shoes. I actually was at his home about a year and a half before he went home to be with the Lord. I had a great time with him. He actually wrote out a blessing for me in my Bible, but in both English and Hebrew. And, uh, but he told some of these most incredible stories of persecution. Uh, I actually have a good friend who's a Calvary pastor that worked for Reverend Wombrandt for a number of years. And he said, Wes, one time we were going to speak at a church and we got caught in a rainstorm. He goes, we got inside the church, we were completely soaked, but fortunately we had our luggage. And the pastor of the church said, Reverend Wombrandt, quickly go into my office and change. You're gonna be on stage in five minutes. He goes, when Richard Wombrandt took his shirt off, he said, the first thing that I noticed, there were three cuts that ran from the top of his shoulder, across his breast, down across his stomach, all the way down. There are places that his body had been burned. There are places that his body had been beaten so badly the color was never returned to its natural color. He goes, but the one thing that I noticed mostly, there was a round circle about the size of half a dollar down on the right-hand side of his stomach, and it was black. And it was also on his back. And I looked at him and I said, Papa, what happened to you? He said, there was a time that they tried to get me to deny my faith, and I refused to do it. So they took an iron poker, they heated it in the fire until it turned orange, and they pushed it all the way through my body, but I refused to deny my faith. When Richard Wombrandt got done that day, folks, I said to myself, I am going to be the last person to leave this place. I don't care if it takes me two or three hours. I need to understand this man's faith. But something would happen that day that would shock me. Now this church probably had at least 15,000 individuals. When the service was over, within about 10 minutes, the entire sanctuary was empty. Now there was four doors on the side and probably three or four at the back. But guys, I watched thousands of people walk past that man. They said, thank you, we'll pray for you. Not one of them did pray for him and not one of them gave him a gift for his ministry. And I thought to myself, did these people not hear what I just heard? I know their pastor, they are well taught. The Bible says to whom much has been given, much shall be required. So I went up to Reverend Wombrandt and I said, Reverend Wombrandt, I don't know how to help, but I would at least like to write a check. Who do I write the check to? And his wife, Sabina, said, Wes, write the check to Jesus. So I got out my checkbook and I wrote out a check for $180. Now guys, it doesn't seem like a lot, but at that time in my life, it was probably all that I had. And then Sabina began to talk to me and she said, you know, my husband spent many years in prison, but I also spent many years in prison. She goes, it was a very dark time in the history of Romania. If you were considered a threat to the state, there was no trial. All it took was for an officer to write an order and they would take you out at midnight and shoot you in a firing squad. She said, we had a young girl that was 17 years old that they had determined was a threat to the state. 
And she goes, and they were going to shoot her that night. And there was a great gloom within the cell because she was a young, beautiful Christian girl, and we could not understand what she had done. She said, but all of a sudden this young girl spoke up and she said, me and my fiance had hoped to glorify Christ in this life by being missionaries, but that is not how I shall glorify him. Tonight, I will glorify him with my death. She said the girl's faith was so dynamic, it was like a light entered into the cell and lifted the spirits of all the women. She said when the guards came to take her away, it was a very radical scene because she, she's a tiny, petite little girl. There's these two huge men, bull of men. They're marching her off to shoot her, and they can hear this young girl in a soft voice speaking to these soldiers. And she says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in him shall never die. And they shot that young girl that night. And guys, that would forever change my life. I would literally never, ever be the same person again. And I'm gonna come back to this young lady again and tell you why it so profoundly affected me. But I wanna to explain to you something. When I went to Africa, guys, I did not go there to be a soldier. I went there to be a pastor. I'm ordained as a Calvary Chapel pastor. I have been for over 25 years. The Bible says it's the love of God that compels people to repentance. My job was to go out there, was to preach the Word of God, to evangelical outreach, to start churches, to teach Bible studies. My wife, Vicki, was going to do the women and children's ministry. But what began to happen was rebel groups began coming down and attacking villages around us. One village, they took 58 children and they crushed their heads against trees. They would come in and rape all the women from the age of nine years old and above. And when they were done with them, the most beautiful of them, they were taken to sexual slavery. Some of these rebel leaders had abducted as many as 70 other women, other men's wives, their daughters, women that had no family, and they took them into sexual slavery. But the women they did want, usually they would just shoot them. But if they didn't shoot them, they'd cut their noses off, their lips, their ears, their breast, their fingers. They wanted to bring great terror to the people, and they were extremely effective about doing that. And the Lord told me, you have got to protect these women and children. So we began to build sanctuaries for the women and children to come in at night. When the sun would begin to set, at first you would just see a trickle of women and children coming in. But by the time the sun went down, they estimated over 44,000 women and children at night were coming and looking for sanctuary. Under every tree, under every veranda, they were trying to escape the enemy and the elements of the weather. Among the South Sudan army, there are great warriors. They're extremely tenacious in battle, but often they would fight extremely hard until they realized they could not win a battle, and then they would pull back and say, live to fight another day. One of the villages that they pulled out of, me and my guys went into right afterwards. The Islamic army came in, they built these huge bonfires, and they picked up all the babies and toddlers and threw them in and burned them alive. And when we got there, we could see the remains of the children in the fire. And the Lord told me, you have got to do something about this. So I sent the men down and said, guys, I want you to understand something here. I go, it is not your job to save your life. It is your job to save their lives. We are men, they are women and children. If the enemy comes, not one of you guys is to pull off that line until we have evacuated every single woman and child. If you die, then you die. That is the role of a man. We are called to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. We are called to care for those that do not have the ability to care for themselves. We know the tactic of the enemy. They do not hit hard targets. They don't come with 200 men and fight 200 men. They're cowards. They come with 200 men and they fight where there's five men. So if they come with 200 men one day and there's only five of us, just know this is the day you're gonna go home to meet the Lord. And you stand and you fight to the last man because in doing so, maybe another 10 or 20 women and children will escape. See guys, I don't know if you've ever seen a child that's truly terrified before, but the most vivid image in my mind was of a little girl. Her mother was killed in a rebel attack. She was probably between two and a half and three years of age. She was just a little waif of a thing. When we found her, she was still holding onto the body of her dead mother. And I remember walking over and picking her up and putting her in my wife Vicky's lap and every part of her body is trembling. Her arms, her chest, her stomach, her thighs, her calves. 
See, what this little girl understands that many of us do not is that in southern Sudan and northern Uganda, monsters are real and they come to kill. And the heart that we have for these children is to be able to say to them, honey, you lay your head down tonight and you sleep and you dream the dreams that a child is supposed to dream. Nobody's going to hurt you tonight. Not on my watch. Tonight the body of Christ is going to wrap its arms around you and we are going to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. Guys, when you're a soldier, you really do read scripture in a different light. You do. I think about King David when he wanted to build the temple of the Lord and God sends the prophet Nathan to him. He says, David, it's good that it's in your heart to do this, but you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. About four years ago, maybe a little longer now, we had an enemy guerrilla unit probing our village, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 men. Our scouts had spotted them, but they were elusive. Every time we'd spot them, they'd fade back into the bush. And I literally had to deploy the chaplains in the field every single night. We'd go out at seven o'clock in the morning, and we'd go in and come back into four or five until we knew that it was clear. This went on for several months, guys. And my standing order during that time was intercept them and kill them all. Don't you let a single one of them get away. Now guys, a lot of people say, well Wes, what about that scripture that says, turn the other cheek? Well guys, turn the other cheek means take an offense for the gospel. It never meant to let them rape your wives, your daughters, young girls, to sell them into sexual slavery, to cut children up, to mutilate them, to burn people alive. It never meant that. I don't know why the church doesn't understand that. As men, we have a God-given right to protect women and children. And I think in my own life, if I decided to build a temple for the Lord, I suspect the Lord would send a prophet to me and say, Wes, it's good that it's in your heart to do this. But you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. The great thing is, guys, is I can build a church, though. And I'd much rather build the church than build a building. Now, my point that I'm making here, guys, and I want to come back to this young lady now, I have heard generals in the South Sudan army talk about me. I've overheard their conversations and it's very, when you're the only white guy out there, you kind of stick out, you know, and they'll say, what is this white guy doing here? And I've heard them say, this man is a very serious soldier. He knows exactly what he's doing in combat. And I do. But see, she was a young girl, barely becoming a woman. She's leaving from being a young girl into becoming a young woman, and she's engaged to be married. And guys, while I'm a soldier, I'm not unaware of how young girls think about marriage. They dream about it their whole life. The ceremony, the wearing of the dress and the veil, the exchanging of the vows, the intimacy they will have with their husband, the children that will be born, and the life and ministry that they could have had together. And all it would have taken for that young girl to have that was to say, I deny Christ, but she chose to die. I said, Lord, if a young girl can give so much for Jesus Christ, I'm a man of war. I handle combat quite well. How much more should my life count for the gospel? So we are living in a generation where we are raising generations of effeminate men in America today. Men do not understand their role anymore. You know, guys, I was actually in Fort Lauderdale probably a little over four years ago, and I'm getting on the airplane and this NFL star gets on the airplane and I mean, this guy's so big, he looks like a gladiator. Now, I don't know who he is, everybody else on the airplane does. And I notice he's got a Louis Vuitton over his shoulder and I look at the guy and I go, wait a minute, I go, isn't that a purse? He goes, no, it's a bag. I said, well, my sister has the same one, but she calls it a purse, you know. <laughs> See, men are so into fashion today. Why was that ever supposed to be important to us? I'm not saying you shouldn't dress appropriately, folks, or dress with dignity, or try to fit in somewhat with society today. But when men are so into fashion, we do not understand what we were created for. We were created to be a wall between our families and the world, the protector, the provider, the spiritual leader. I want to share with you about one of my chaplains in the last three weeks of his life. And guys, you're going to see him on a video in a moment. You'll recognize him. Uh, because he's got a large gap between his two upper front teeth. His name is Peter Guy. 
And uh, I don't know why, but in East Africa, if you have a large gap between your two upper front teeth, you're considered a very handsome man or a very good looking woman. I, I don't know why, it's just part of African culture. Uh, beauty is extremely different in Africa. If you're thin, they don't think you're very good looking over there. If you're overweight, they think you're great looking over there. I told my wife, I said, honey, you gotta be careful. I said, I'm like the Fabio of our village out here, you know, just very different. But guys, we got word from the front that Peter had been killed. It was May of 2014. We actually lost three men on that day. What happened is the enemy launched a massive offensive that came down with 7,000 soldiers. Peter's unit was the first one scrambled and sent to attack while we were trying to assemble other units. They hit them headlong. We fought three major battles. 300 men were killed. There were 400 men left. There was an ominous feeling among all the soldiers that everybody was gonna die. And the ominous feeling was correct. Every single one of them was gonna die. The only reason we know what happened is because we had a fourth chaplain and about two days before the final battle, he was sent out as a runner. And he told us about the final days of Peter's life. And he said, Wes, Peter was really suffering in the final days of his life. He said a month before he died, his wife left him for another man. And she said to him, I do not want to be married to a pastor. I do not want to be in the ministry. I want a better life. There's no better life there. It was just lust for another man. But it broke his heart. But it didn't break his spirit. He said, while Peter was suffering, he said he would not tell the men in our unit what was going on. He goes, I would watch him. He would go out there. He would take his Bible. He would sit down with 30 men, open up the Word of God. And 20 minutes later, all their heads would go down. He'd lead them to Christ. And then there'd be 10 and then 15 and five and another 20. And when he was absolutely exhausted, he would come back and suffer in silence with us and say, I don't know why she left. I loved her. He couldn't wrap his head around it. He goes, when he'd get his strength, he'd go out and do it all over again. He said a week before he was killed, his sister called him and said, Peter, your wife has left you. You need to leave the military, come home and take care of your children. And Peter responded and said, first of all, I am a soldier within the South Sudan army. If I were to leave, that is desertion, which is punishable by firing squad. He said, but far beyond that, in the book of John, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go. He goes, I was chosen by God to be here at this place and time, and I will not leave my post. We were in communication with him before the last battle. And guys, the last transmission we got was, we see a large army arrayed against us. We will call you after the battle. The call never came. All 400 men were killed. We have never recovered Peter's body or our other two men. They lie among some 700 men whose bodies are no longer distinguishable by the ravages of war. But I have often thought about when he crossed over. See, Peter didn't just cross over by himself. He crossed over with 400 men that he led to Christ. Whatever the suffering, whatever the heartache, whatever the betrayal that he might have felt, he is a prince in the kingdom of God and his reward will be great. Guys, the Bible gives us the story of the 10 minas. And it says, God gives a mina to three men. One bears 10, one bears five, one bears in the ground. And what this is talking about is bearing fruit or winning souls for Jesus Christ. Now it says, to the one that bore 10, he goes, you're gonna be in charge of 10 cities. To the one that bore five, he says, you're gonna be in charge of five cities. To the one that buried in the ground, he says, take it away and give it to the one that has 10. They go, but sir, he already has 10. He goes, to everyone who has, more will be given but it's for the one that has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. And what this scripture is talking about is bearing fruit or winning souls for the kingdom of God. Is Peter in charge of 400 cities? I don't know. But what I do know is the Bible says, the eye is not seen, the ear is not heard, the mind cannot conceive the things that God has prepared for those that love him. One of the things that you have to ask yourself as believers, King David said, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. Has your service to Christ ever cost you? Have you ever written a check to the, your home church that you actually felt it? Now you tithe and that's wonderful, but have you ever given a gift that you actually, you, you felt the pinch of it? Have you ever shared your faith when you weren't sure if it was safe? Have you ever done a ministry that you did not want to do? I said, well, what do you do in ministry? Music, do you love music? Yes, and that's wonderful. But have you ever done a ministry that you didn't want to do like childcare? You know, guys, it's interesting because I went to Mike McIntosh's School of Evangelism back in 1984. 
And one Wednesday night, Mike came out and he said, hey, one of the ladies didn't show up for childcare, we need a volunteer. Well, I had no intention to volunteer. There were probably 300 women in that auditorium, but not one single one of them raised their hand. They knew something I didn't. It got uncomfortable, so finally I raised my hand. I got the four-year-olds. I would rather be back in Sudan being shot at <laughs> than ever go through that experience again. If I ever do childcare again, I'm taking a gun with me. I think it's only fair. But my point is, has your ministry ever cost you anything? See, treasures are earned and they're stored. We're gonna show you a DVD right now, guys, and as you watch this, the first part is about the Syrian church. We're actually operating in 29 countries today. We're in seven of the 10 most dangerous Islamic countries in the world. We're in the areas of Taliban, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, we have, we're sponsoring, so far we have, I think, about 400 pastors that are fully sponsored in these areas of the world. We're going our way to 700. But we're fully sponsoring these guys to work in the underground. The second part, you'll see all the chaplains that have been killed, especially Peter Guy. And remember, he's got the gap. Watch for that. But while the first part is hard to watch because it's inspiring, but the second part, you'll see all the men that we've lost in the service of Christ. Let's go ahead and run that, guys. When the war start, many problems happened, and it's so difficult to continue the ministry. And uh, we know some some day uh, the problems is come inside our homes, not just in our city or in our area. Uh, at that time, I speak to the leaders, and uh, we met together. And I said, as in Acts book, the believers when they have the persecuted most of them they go out of Jerusalem. If you want now to go out of your area or out of Syria to save your families, this is good if God gave you this to do. But uh, we, we must to know maybe one day the problems come to our families and to our life. And maybe we will lost our life one day. You know, when I left the room and after a time, I turned back to see the decision of the leaders. I found 25 people. They stand there and they said, we will not leave. We will continue to serve God here in this area and we will continue the ministry. If we are die, we will go to Jesus. And if we leave here, we will be with Jesus. And you know, but they asked me something to do. They said, if one of our team die, you know we are non-Christian background and no one will take care about our body if we killed or something happened to us. Uh, what we can do if this happened? For that, we buy this land and we built a graveyard. This graveyard for if anyone killed from our team, we can put him there. This is the first building of our ministry. I think it's first uh, happened in a Raqqa city in Syria. They give the chance for the uh, Christian. They said to him, if you leave your Christianity now, you can be uh, hold your life, or if not, we will kill you. This, this decision is, you, you know, it's must to, to, to take it directly. And most of the uh, Christians said, no, we are ready to die for Jesus. And for that, they, uh, you, you can see many uh, pictures about the Christian. They put them in the cross. And when they put them, many times they put in the uh, area, all the people can see them. To learn the people, if you will be Christian, this is your what will happen to you. Uh, and uh, most of the people, I thank God for these uh, heroes in the faith. They die for Jesus and they put them in the cross. You remember when I told you about the stories about the man who uh, was his son and uh, they bring them and they ask them to leave uh, them faith in Jesus Christ. But the father said no and the son said no. And they asked the father, if you don't 
come to Islam now, we will, we will kill your son in front of your, your eyes. And after that, they cut the head of the son and they start to play football in his head, front of his father's eyes. This is something incredible. You cannot understand what's happened. But through all this bad news, you can see the hope is growing between this uh, uh, difficult and uh, bad people. You know, so sometimes many people ask me why, why you continue in the ministry in Syria, especially in this time in the war. The important things for, uh, for our life to be in God willing. This is our call from God to, uh, to do the ministry in Syria. When we are inside the, the God willing, that means we are in the safe place. But if we are go out of God willing and go out of Syria, that means we are in the dangerous place. Maybe I, I can go like to Lebanon, to Jordan, to US, to, to anywhere and continue my life there. But that means I am go out of God willing. That means I am in dangerous. The important things in our life, not to be alive, but to be with Jesus willing. But if I am in, inside the dangerous, but in God willing, that means I am in the safe place. This is my belief and I trust in Jesus. He will keep my life. And when he wants me to go to him, I am ready to do this.
Folks, we have now lost 65 men in the service of Jesus Christ. I think since the last time I was here, 45 more men have made that final journey to the other side. As believers, one of the things we need to realize is we are called to live these exceptional lives for the gospel. And see, we're to be set apart from the world. We're not supposed to fit in the world. If you feel like you're different, if you feel like I don't quite fit in, you know what, you're probably in a great place to be because you were never meant to fit in. We are to be a light in darkness. We are to be God's voice in a time when people are not sharing the truth anymore. People are afraid to preach the gospel because they're afraid of persecution. What your pastor was so eloquently trying to share with you today is that the, basically the Democratic Party has said, you have absolute religious freedom as long as you don't disagree with us. But if you disagree with us, we're coming after you. Some of you out there are that way and you believe that they're great people. I don't vote by party, I vote by biblical values. If you vote for someone who's pro-abortion, you're an accomplice to the murder. You cannot get away from that. If you vote pro-perversion, it's an abomination to your God. I'm not here to represent myself, guys. I'm here to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And guys, people tell me all the time, well, I was born this way. I said, the problem with that is that the pedophile will say he was born this way. The serial killer will say he was born this way. The young boy that wants to sleep with every girl that he can will say he was born this way. I don't doubt it. We're born into sin. Jesus said you must be born again. I was born a killer. It was Christ that redeemed me. And I take no pride in my former life. I died that he might live. In closing this morning, I wanna share a couple things with you folks. We have this thought that there's a bottom that you hit, that just, Satan just can't go down any further. But after 20 some years, over 25 years in the South Sudan, there's no truth in that at all. We began to have rebels come in our area and capture families, and African families can be quite large. Five, six, seven kids is normal. 13, 14 is not unusual. They started taking little girls, nine of 10 years of age, and they would give them a machete and say, cut the head off your mother. If the child refuses, they say, if you do not cut that off your mother, we will cut that off your father, your mother, your brothers, and your sister, and then we're going to kill you. I have counseled many of these children, and there's no English ability to explain to you what that's like. We don't have words for it. I've shared with many people, and I know they find this quite shocking, but I've said, you know, I have never had a problem with having to take human life. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. I do not enjoy killing. I never have, and I never will. But when men come to rape women, to cut them up, to mutilate them, to murder children, we'll do exactly what it takes to stop them. And we're not apologetic about it. As men, we have a God-given right to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. I do a lot of study of history, folks, and I was reading about the Knight Templars, and the Knight Templars lived a 1,000 years ago. And a lot of people said to me, well, Wes, are you defending the Catholic Church? I said, well, first of all, a thousand years ago, the Catholic Church was the church. And guys, the church has always been the church. In every denomination, you'll find true believers and you will find false believers. I, when I was in South Sudan, when I arrived there over 25 years ago, I met a Catholic priest, an Italian man. He'd been out there for 30 years. Now, I don't agree with his doctrine, but there was no doubt in my mind that that man loved God and to the best of his ability, he was trying to share his faith. I have met Calvary Chapel pastors that have committed adultery, that have been pedophiles and put to jail for it, that have, I knew one, they got a woman pregnant and killed her to hide it. See, a tree is known by its fruit. A good tree bears good fruit. We're to live above reproach. But when you became a Knight Templar, you chose a life of celibacy. You were never allowed to marry. You were never anything but God's chosen soldier and servant on this earth to serve and protect the church. You wore the white robe with the red cross, the white shield with the red cross, and the job of the Templar was to protect Christians as they're doing pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And a thousand years ago, Arabs were raiding them, raping them, killing them, selling them into slavery. You know, in Islam, it's legal to make a woman become a prostitute. Wonderful religion. When Saladin was marching with his army to retake Jerusalem, 140 knights found out that he was coming, and they set out to intercept him. But Saladin was not alone, folks. He was with 7,000 Saracen soldiers. They found him near Nazareth because there was a natural well there. 
And one day's march behind him was the main body of his army, which was over 100,000 men. And some of the knights wanted to turn and leave, but there was a knight by the name of Gerard. And Gerard said, listen, men, we have been sworn to serve. We have been sworn to protect. And whether we live or we die, we will be with Christ. And 140 knights attacked 7,000 Saracen soldiers. They were utterly destroyed. The last one to fall was a man by the name of James of Malise. And when all the other knights had been killed, he mounted his horse and he charged a thousand Saracens. The Saracens were so taken by his bravery, they begged him to surrender. They said, we will not harm you. We will not enslave you. We will not torture you. We will let you go. Just surrender. But he was sworn to protect, so he fought until they killed him. What's interesting about this story is it's not a part of Christian history. All the Christians were dead. This is a part of Islamic history. Let your light so shine before men that they see your heavenly Father. Folks, in closing this morning, and I know we need to wrap this up, but I'm gonna ask Robert to come up here in just a minute. I wanna encourage you, you need to get in the battle. You need to start sharing your faith and you will be persecuted for it. See, I talk to many people and I'll say, do you ever share your faith? They go, well, it's not my gift. I said, you know, it's interesting because the scripture says, go into the world and make disciples of all men unless it's not your gift. Only doesn't say that, does it? Being good at something is not a reason of why we do it or not. My son is not good at cleaning his room. I require him to do it. We are called to live above reproach. Guys, I don't know what the greatest desire of your life is, but I will tell you what the greatest desire of my life is. And I'm not saying this, I do not want your praise, I do not want any accolades, I'm just trying to make a very strong biblical point for you. Call it a premonition, a gut feeling. I have a very serious sense that I will not live out my natural life. I suspect at some point I'm gonna be killed in the South Sudan. And when that day comes and I stand before a holy God, and I look into his eyes for the first time, I want to hear him say, well done, son. Well done. My prayer for you is that you will experience the best. Don't start making it once a year or once a lifetime, but start inviting people to church every Sunday. You don't even have to beat them up with the gospel. Bring them down here, let Robert beat them up with the gospel. Guys, you do not realize it. I know your pastor. He's got a pastor's heart. He loves you. He's invested in you. Elizabeth has a pastor's heart. She loves you. She ministers to you. I thought about being a pastor once, but I realized I had to like people, and I thought, well, it's just not going to work for me. I better be a foreign missionary. To whom much has been given, much shall be required. In closing this morning, we want to give you an opportunity if you would like to be involved, and I'm gonna preface this by saying, do not take it out of your church tithing. Your church needs your tithing. Like King David said, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. If you decide to do this, please do it as a gift above and beyond. But we've taken on 700 pastors in the underground. All the money we're raising, we're sending to five different organizations. We're not keeping a penny of it, guys. It's all going to different people. Matter of fact, people said, Wes, why would you raise money and send it to us? I said, because I'm building God's kingdom and not ours. It's not my life. It's $75 to support one of these. Now, you'll only get the information here. The only update we'll ever give you on this person is if they're killed. If they are found out, they will be murdered. We can't tell you anything about them. Then we have our children of war program. Right now, we have children in Liberia. A rear admiral in the Navy, a female rear admiral was retired. She approached me and said, Wes, I have all these kids in Liberia, but I don't have any money to put them through school. I said, give them to them. We'll raise the support. Everything we get goes to her. We don't keep a nickel of it. It's $50 for one of these. And then we have our chaplains. Many of you know about these. It's $75 to sponsor a chaplain. Now, these are automatic debits. The guys will explain to you at the back how that works out. It comes out on the third of each month. Do not pick them up and walk away without filling out the paperwork. We won't know if they're sponsored, folks. And I only share this because people ask me every Sunday, what if I want to do all three? We're not asking you to do that. But if you decide to do it and it's not going to hurt your tithing, it's $200. As believers, we have been given this one precious life to serve Christ. 
And guys, it's precious. It's a whisper in your gone. If you live for the things of the world, you will miss what you were created for. But if you run a race of endurance, you will change the world for Christ. 98% of all Christians will never lead one single person to Christ in their life. And guys, I share this with you. Store your treasures. My 65th chaplain died eight weeks ago Sunday. His name was Paul Qual. One of the few that didn't get shot or blown up with a bomb. He got two forms of hepatitis in the field that destroyed his liver. I tried to send him to India to have it transplant, but the doctor said, Wes, we can't save him. He could barely get out of bed. Every day they're pour, pumping a quart and a half of water out of his stomach. Every day he gets out of his bed, he goes to every bed in the hospital and shares his faith. He was storing his last treasures. Eight weeks ago Sunday, he called his family to his bed, his wife, eight kids, and one in the womb. He said, I die well. I have lived with Christ. I die with Christ. All of you follow me. And I want to encourage you as a church, as Paul said, do as I do, follow Christ. God bless you. Robert. And I'm super grateful. You know, we don't talk about it a lot. God has been, you know, real faithful to us over the years. But one of my life verses, one of the, one of the things that God really grabbed my heart with early on is from Luke chapter 12. In verse 29, Jesus said, do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. That's their focus. And your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that doesn't fail, where no thief appro approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I said that's one of my life passages, I guess, one of my life verses, because the, the day God called me into ministry, that was the verse he used. Sell everything, you're leaving. And I'm, I made a decision that day to give everything to him and, and, and just and walk away from life as I knew it for whatever he had. God showed me something back then. It's actually easier to die for Jesus than it is to live for him. If you put a, a, a gun in my face and said, deny Christ, if you poked a red hot poker through my insides and said, deny Christ, absolutely not. Kill me and get it over with. But when you say to me, listen, you know, this is, a, this is a, an audience made up of a lot of different religious faiths, so w you need to be really careful and maybe, maybe you should, well, we're going to need you to pray a non-sectarian prayer today and be sensitive to your audience. W when there's peer pressure when the secular culture around you, when your boss says, listen, I know you're a really religious person, but you're going to need to leave that at home. And when your government says, listen, that, that's kind of a, an outdated and, and even immoral view, discriminating against people just because of their well, who they love. How can you discriminate? People don't choose who they fall in love with. How, how can you discriminate against somebody for who they love? That's just immoral. When they begin to put that kind of pressure on you, to deny Christ in subtle ways. You, you know what I find? And I'm not going to preach another sermon. 
because I want you to go talk with Wes and Edward and Ed, and I want you to to get to know them and consider this this ministry. But see, here's the thing, and I've talked about this before. It's so troubling to me as a pastor. God has always taken good care of us, right? But see, I know because dealing with the bankers and dealing with refinancing and all that kind of stuff, I have to look at it. We have 54 consistent giving units in Calvary Chapel, Miami Beach, out of roughly five, six hundred people who regularly attend. So that tells me that almost 90% of you are not regularly giving to God. And you're going to answer to God, not to me. I don't know who you are. I try not to know the details because that way I can stand up here and boldly say, I question your Christianity. Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't want to face Jesus on my judgment day and have him say to me, 90% of the people in the church you pastored are in hell today. What were you doing? Father, I pray for these people who are gathered here. And I, I ask you, please, Holy Spirit, deal with their hearts. You're the only one who can know. The rest of us, we... We can't pass judgment because we can't see. And I, I know, God, that it's your desire that every single one of them move beyond the superficial cultural religiosity to a place of genuine faith, a place where the spirit of life lives inside them and gives life to their mortal body. So I pray the ones who are unsaved, the ones who remain dead in their trespasses and sins today, whether they're here in the room or watching this thing online, I pray, God, that you would squeeze their hearts, that that Damascus Road experience would be theirs today as you confront them with an offer of forgiveness and grace and new life in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to quickly close in worship. If you want to talk to us, please do so. You can send an email, pastor at calvarymiamibeach.org. As always, pastor at calvarymiamibeach.org. We'll send you free info. We'll pray for you. We love you guys. Thank you.